Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the most central themes in the Grand Inquisitor chapter in Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, Book 5, is that of freedom. You see this word popping up over and over again. It doesn't always mean exactly the same thing. It's kind of a slippery equivocal term. And it is something that is being discussed in order to say it's great, say it's bad, say it's problematic. And we can also talk about the dynamic that is being laid out, being narrated by the Grand Inquisitor. The idea is that freedom is a problem for human beings. And this is interesting because typically in the history of philosophy and so many other things, we talk about freedom as being a great thing. We can't have enough of it. It's wonderful. Um, Christ is being depicted here as he is in so many other places as having come to free human beings to give them more freedom. And the Grand Inquisitor is saying freedom, you know, can be a good thing, but it's also a abyss. It's a terrible thing. It is, it presents so many problems for human beings that if we want them to be happy, we need to free humanity of their freedom. And one way that you can free humanity, of course, is just imposing some sort of order upon them and saying, everybody will do exactly as we say, otherwise we'll kill you, we'll torture you, we'll do tor terrible things to you. That's actually a very ineffective way of trying to get rid of freedom. Instead, you have to, you have to work at it. You have to figure out how freedom operates and what the things that free human beings desire are and then how to get them to give that freedom up freely. And so the Grand Inquisitor uh, talks here. He says that the people are more certain than ever before that they are completely free. At the same time, they themselves have brought us their freedom and obediently laid it at their feet. It is our doing. Is it what you wanted? This sort of freedom. And then Alyosha, because this is a conversation, of course, between Alyosha, the younger brother, and Ivan. Alyosha says, I don't understand. Is he being ironic? And, and Ivan says, not in the least. He lays it to his and his colleagues credit that they finally overcome freedom, have done so in order to make people happy. So what, what's going on here? So this, let's talk about what freedom is first. Freedom, by its very nature, the freedom that human beings possess, cannot be brought under one rigid concept because it escapes that. Freedom is always going to be more free than one would like it to be because freedom can also be used to decide what our very freedom means. This is sort of a typical existentialist position on freedom, and that's running through here because Dostoevsky is one of the first existentialists. So freedom is a capacity for ourselves to choose things. To, some people would also define it as being able to do what it is that we want. And there's a number of different ways of understanding freedom. But even more important is the capacity to choose how we're going to commit ourselves, whether we're going to pursue good or choose evil. It is possible to choose evil. According to somebody like Dostoevsky, a lot of philosophers have said, oh, people never choose evil for its own sake. It's always under the guise of something else. Well, true. 
but you can like dimly suspect that the thing that you're choosing is wrong and still choose it, whether it be pleasure or making money or whatever uh, in certain circumstances, right? Uh, rebellion itself could be, could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Human beings have this raw capacity that they're often not fully aware of and often, we can say, never fully exercise in any one single act. Now, interestingly, the Grand Inquisitor says nothing is more insufferable for humans and human society than freedom. And you might say, well, why would that possibly be the case? Freedom is great. It's what allows us to choose the right thing. It's what allows us to decide what to make of ourselves. Yes, but it's also what allows us to choose to impose horrible suffering or even just annoyance on other people, including innocent children, as talked about in the chapter just before. It's what allows us to accept God or to reject God or to get into an interminable arguments about what exactly God is or what God said and how to interpret what God said and all these sorts of things. Freedom by itself is not always experienced as a wonderful thing. When somebody is an aggressor towards you, or even says words that you find disconcerting because they disrupt your uh, view of the world or your you know, closely held dogmas, that's their use of their freedom. They are also free beings. And you can find yourself as a free being doing terrible things as well to others, to yourself. Freedom is also something that makes us responsible, that says you bear a weight upon your shoulders. You choose good or evil, you are the chooser, choose rightly. And if we choose the wrong thing and we bear the consequences of it, sometimes we say things like, why didn't somebody stop me? You know, well, because you're free, right? So freedom is, you know, a terrible burden for human beings. It's also, you know, sort of a, a crowning achievement and a way that we're similar to other rational beings and to God, but it is very difficult for people to, to bear. And the Grand Inquisitor talks about Christ's coming, not at this point in time, but although it's a danger right now, but um, in, in the narrative, but about his, his original coming. This is the eternal entering into time. This is God taking on flesh and walking among human beings and loving them and teaching them and dying for them ultimately. All of this is supposed to provide greater freedom. And he criticizes Christ saying, you know, you could have taken their freedom from them. You could have actually made them happy. Instead, you actually like worsened the problem of the human condition. So the advent of the, what we call the Christ event, which is really a whole set of events, um, that actually sort of opened up a wound within the world and within human nature. Rather than simply healing everything, it made our difficulties even worse because now instead of just having an old law that you're supposed to follow, now you've got to choose between the old law and, and Christ, the new law, the, the gospel, right? And you also have to choose how you're going to interpret that and you have to choose whether you're going to follow it. Christ's coming didn't actually make things easier. And actually, you know, I think Dostoevsky would say for any Christians out there who say, oh, I've, I've got everything figured out because I've got Jesus, he would probably say, that's actually not Christianity. And again, an existentialist position on that. So Christ gets criticized for giving humans more freedom, which is not necessarily a good thing for them. It depends on what they make of that freedom. He's also criticized for having done the things that he does because he's capable of it, not taking account of how weak and corrupt human beings actually are, that they're likely to make bad use of that freedom that he's given, that Christ is giving them. There's another discussion that's also relevant to this. And I think, you know, the, the setting for this is the, you know, 1500s, right? But Dostoevsky is writing towards his own time. In this case, Ivan is, you know, speaking on behalf of this new age that we're in, the age of enlightenment. 
in which you know there's freedom of different sorts. People are becoming emancipated politically, economically. Um, free reason that was sort of a a hallmark of the Enlightenment, and that it spread into society. People get to, to think and choose for themselves, and the sciences. And he, the Grand Inquisitor says. He's sort of predicting、uh, what's going to be happening ahead of time. These lead human beings into a maze, a labyrinth. We often think of, well, you know, the capacity to use your political or economic or social freedom, and you know, the ability to think by yourself, and you know, develop the sciences, reliable ways of understanding the natural world, the human beings, all sorts of other things as well. These are just going to make everything fall into place. No, they actually make us more of an enigma to ourselves. All the people who are like, you know, neuroscience has shown us X, Y, Z. You know, they would be perfect examples. Of this, and you wonder what they think in the dead of the night when they realize the foundations of their sciences are so shaky, and that there's so much that's being、um, sort of willed. This is very similar to a Nietzschean conception here on the part of Ivan talking in, through the Grand Inquisitor. These things we could we could believe in them as sort of dogmas, but the more that you actually know about These matters. The more in which you experience them, the shakier things get, and the more our freedom bedevils us. So this is the Grand Inquisitor's complaint and, and case. Now, what is the remedy? Well, the Grand Inquisitor and his colleagues—they are an elite class of human beings, and they are going to, as human beings, make use of their own freedom. To change the situation for human beings, they can't radically change human nature. They've got to work with that. They can't eliminate the fact that Christ came and made things more complicated. Although they can try to, you know, stem that right now with this Christ showing up again, which is what the Grand Inquisitor is doing. But they can at least work with the, you know, way in which society is set up to. Take that freedom and do something with it. They can free humanity of freedom, and so he goes on.、Uh, only now, and this is Ivan. He says he's referring, of course, to the Inquisition. Has it become possible to think for the first time about human happiness? Man was made a rebel. How can re- can rebels be happy? You were warned. You had no lack of warnings and indications, but you did not heed the warnings. You rejected the only way of arranging for human happiness. But fortunately, on your departure, you handed the work over to us. He's talking to Christ. Christ should have brought human happiness. Instead, he brought freedom, and then handed it over to the church. And now the church, as this you know organization governing human beings, they're going to make human beings happy at last. He says, "You promised. You established with your word. You gave us the right to bind and loose." And so, how is this actually going to be understood? Well, the Grand Inquisitor and his colleagues, this this long process of self-selecting elite human beings, have figured out the fundamental problematics of humanity, the human condition. And they're going to prioritize happiness, which means that freedom has to be used to, as much as possible, eliminate itself. So, what is the the key here? Get humanity to freely lay their freedom at the feet of the Grand Inquisitor, the Inquisition, the Church, whatever it's going to be. Now, here's a good place to pause. This this、uh, presentation here, this poem on the part of Ivan. Doesn't necessarily have to be about the Catholic Church. It could be about any form of social organization in which there's an elite that is saying, "We understand the human condition. We're going to fix things for it for you. Place your trust in us. Give us your freedom. Freely give us your freedom, and we will make you happy." So there's a lot wider scope here, but. Coming back to the sort of explicitly Christian setting, this is all articulated in accordance with the three temptations found in the gospel account 
of Christ fasting in the desert and then being tempted by the dreaded intelligent spirit, the spirit of self-destruction and non-being, the devil, right? And there are three um, temptations and with each one, Christ responds actually by, by citing a, a biblical verse. Um, so he says, uh, this is Ivan, he says that, was it possible to say anything more true than what he proclaimed to you in his three questions, which you rejected and which the books refer to as temptations? These provide a sort of framework for understanding the human condition. So here's, here's another thing he says that's quite interesting. If it were possible to imagine these three questions of the dread spirit had been lost from the books without a trace and it was necessary they be restored, thought up and invented anew, to be put back into the books and to that end all the wise men on earth were brought together and given this task to think up to invent three questions such as would not only correspond to the scale of the event, the devil and Christ, but moreover would express in three words, in three human phrases only, the entire future history of the world and mankind. He goes on and he says, the questions alone, simply by the miracle of their appearance, we can see we're dealing with a mind not human and transient, but eternal and absolute. In these three questions, all of subsequent human history is as if brought together in a single whole and foretold. So, you know, this is quite an interesting speculation here about, uh, you know, the nature of these, these questions essentially being eternal. And the three temptations provide a framework for harnessing human freedom. The first one is bread. You know, why don't you, the hungry person, turn these stones into bread and thereby feed yourself? And then by extension, why don't you, Christ, turn, you know, things into bread and provide for human needs? Well, we'll do that for you. Because what we're doing there is providing security. We're providing freedom from want. And if you could just provide these, then human beings will lay their freedom down at your feet. They will give up their freedom in order to have material prosperity or even just survival and security. So that's, that's one important source of the freedom being used by the people to give up their freedom. The second, miracles, mystery, and authority. The Grand Inquisitor says, human beings don't just have to live, they have to have something to live for. They need something to believe in. By not giving enough miracles, not having enough mystery and authority, you make things shaky. You, you let people choose for themselves. There were times in the, in the biblical accounts where Christ would be asked to do a miracle and he'd say, nah, you know, faith, that's important. Better, better to believe without seeing these miracles, or as they're called in the book of uh, the Gospel of John, signs. Better to believe without this stuff. That's your choice. But a lot of people are like, no, 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 I gotta have a sign. And then the sign won't be enough. They're like, I need somebody to interpret that sign for me, an authority. I need to, I need to be secure. There's a kind of security that's not just one of material things, but of spiritual things. Finally, power and authority. The temptation is, see all these kingdoms of the earth? Just, you know, you want them? I'll give them to you. And then Christ says, nah. Uh, let those alone. So somebody will come along. It, when you turn down power, you can be guaranteed that you're not turning it down, you know, for yourself and then the power goes away. Somebody else will come along and take it. And why is it important that that happen? Because there is within humanity this universal desire for what the Grand Inquisitor calls a universal and gen general union, a concord, a harmony of people, an end to conflict. These three things, certainty, security, harmony, these are very powerful objects of desire for human beings, not least because by the way that we use our freedom, we often don't have these. So the Grand Inquisitor is getting the human beings, the Grand Inquisitor and all of his colleagues, to abandon 
their freedom, to lay their freedom down at the feet of this power elite, this intellectual elite, this elite that provides them with security in order for them to live a happy existence. So we have freedom versus happiness. Which are you going to choose? And the masses choose because the problem has been set up in such a way. The masses choose happiness and to give up their freedom. 